our farm is a third generation farm. Uh, I've been around the farm all of my life. I grew up on the farm, did leave, uh, got a degree in accounting and was gone from the farm for about 20 years. Came back full time in 2011. That time I came back to the same farming system that I grew up with, was full tillage, uh, just a wheat fallow system, no other crops grown. Um, with that was anhydrous ammonia fertilizer was what we used. I think in 2012 or so, I happened to stroll by the local NRCS office and um, that they had a very robust group in there and they were trying to get people to come in and, and join basically. The cult is what we called it and I, I took the bait. We had an exclusive invite to Ray Archuleta, the Ray the Soil Guy. You know, and I looked him up on YouTube, not, well, this could be good. And that kind of was the start of it. Bought my first no-till drill in 13, converted everything that year, and really haven't looked back. There was crossover just because there was a change in equipment. You know, I don't know that my father had to go through that. He, there's still equipment around here that I think my grandfather used, you know, because it still has a utility. And so to all of a sudden just say, hey, your, your equipment doesn't work anymore. In fact, I, one day, probably in one of our disagreements about how this was going to transition, he just said, you're, you, I feel like you're telling me I didn't, I didn't farm right. And it, it was actually a kind of a come to Jesus, kind of heartwarming moment in that I'm not questioning anything the way you farm. You farmed with the best technology you had and not bragging because he's my father. He was one hell of a farmer. We're, they considered a shrub step area. Uh, it was channeled out by the Missoula flood. And so when that flood broke loose or that dam broke loose over Montana, uh, everything washed across here, dropped the basalt. Outcroppings, either that or cut it down to that. Um, what soil was left, I don't know the, the geological history to that, but blew for several years and blew out of here. And so we're left with a basically a channeled scab land. And uh, the old timers tell you that when they got here, the grass was as tall as the horse. And this was great grazing. I also was told that they probably overgrazed it. And so then the, the sagebrush filled in. We now, you know, we now know Mother Nature's gonna fill it in with something. And it decided it needed a broadleaf and it decided that sagebrush was a good idea. You know, I'm sure farming started after the turn of the century. And so our soils are very, very shallow. And so a hundred years of tillage, I have a lot of farm ground that can't be farmed anymore. We've farmed it down to the rocks. Everybody says their farming area is unique. I'm no more unique than anyone else. I'm just unique to me. And so it, it brings its own challenges, but it also brings its own opportunities. Um, you know, in this low rainfall area, I get six to nine inches of rain a year. This soil can't, I mean, I, I have basically farm in a bathtub. It can't get away from me. Um, it's heavy volcanic ash. Um, and so it kind of has a hold, water holding capacity. So I, we feel like we really can maximize that six inches of rain a year. And so now, you know, now that we've implemented some of the soil health principles, we really see it performing or beginning to perform. Um, so that gave us hope to, to keep moving forward with those principles. I would be very, very honest in saying I've never had a hesitation. In fact, I'm probably the other way. We just, I, we either read something, learn something, and I come home and I try it. Uh, probably my biggest weakness is, is instead of trying it on 10 acres, I usually try it on a thousand. And so my, my learning moments, they're not failures, they're learning moments, are on a larger scale than probably most people can stomach. But I, I my management style is, is I need to know fast. I don't have a lot of chances left in this, in my opinion. And so I need it to happen fast. And so that a 10 acre plot doesn't do it for me. If we think something ought to try to work here, then we, we throw it on the ground and get going. So I mean, as you look at those soil health principles and you know, the big ones, obviously we started with no-till, you know, and then we felt like adding canola, if you can imagine, was a big deal with when you get to crop rotation. Uh, in 13, part of an NRCS grant, we added cover crops. And so trying to get to that soil armor um, issue, uh, we added added cattle in 15, so trying to get the cattle integration. We variable rated all of our fertilizer clear back in 13. And so we had areas that just never saw fertilizer that actually produced better. Um, we implemented all the technolo latest technologies with regard to GPS and guidance to 
to get away from overlap, to, to reduce our fertilizer and chemicals. Uh, one of the bigger things I think we're doing now is, is my rotations uh, have not seen a industrialized fertilizer in applied in soil in three years. And so we've moved all of the fertility is to a foliar system. I became a, a believer early on that I needed to let the plant decide how to process those nutrients and not screw up the soil biology. Everything has a carbon source. And so we, you know, we make sure we use a humic or a fulvic depending on what we're doing. Um, but I, I think the big thing is, is in, you know, you, you get back to diversity. Uh, the cover crops, I think, are going to play a big role in that. We do have a lot of crop alterations now. Uh, there are alternatives now that we grow sunflowers, um, millet, sorghum, oats, uh, wheat, canola. I try never to follow one crop or the other, i.e. wheat never follows wheat. The biggest thing I'm trying to get rid of is fallow. I'm trying to keep soil biology active and alive. Our goal, by the time I retire, there will be no more fallow here. One principle can't react or can't operate without the other. And so I've got to have less disturbance so I can get a growing root with those crop rotation, whether it be a cover crop. And the cover crop doesn't work without a cow. Each thing you implement brings its own, its own diversity that you could implement in just in those five or six soil health principles. I have 13 landlords. Uh, we just happen to be kind of the last man standing in our area. And so right off the bat, I, I knew that, you know, this is a significant change. All, most of all of those landlords had farmed sometime in their career. And so they needed, they needed to be brought in and, and I needed buy-in. And so one of the things we did is we held landlord days or we brought in, I actually brought in speakers and then we tied that to what we were doing on their ground. And then we, the one soil health day that we had with the landlord, we took them out in the field and handed them all shovels. We made them get shovels and, and see what we were doing where you could show them the dreadlocks or the way the roots were associating with the soil biology. They could feel it and see it on their own land. That was a huge win. I would tell you that if there was a downside to that, I created a bunch of little soil health experts. And now I get a lot of phone calls and emails, hey, have you tried this? And so I don't, is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? It, it's actually, I consider it a wonderful thing because they want to know what we're trying next. Uh, and so I, I've been extended a lot of latitude. And probably the only other thing would be obviously a banker. In a monoculture cropping system in the United States, we're heavily reliant on crop insurance. Crop insurance does not care for a cover crop or crop diversity or anything that's kind of outside the norm. And that's probably been my only other barrier because I'm still in that situation. I'm still monoculture on a lot of my, my acres and still have to afford the equipment and the transition uh, to the system. I, I've not suffered any yield decreases, so that was a big one. You know, you're able to go to the banker and go, hey, look, I'm still in compliance. I'm still able to, to basically tell you that I'm gonna make averages and that's how we build our budget and stuff like that. But it's those things that you can't quantify that you just drive by and go, wow, look what soil, look how the soil responded to that cow being there in that cover crop. You know, why, why is that holding moisture when that crop or that field has never held moisture before? You drive around and see something just would might seem innocuous to anybody else. That's enough to keep you going and go, okay, now we gotta figure out how to do that better or on a grander scale. Yeah, so one of the changes we made this year um, is, is we've moved to a, uh, using an extract out of worm castings. And that's basically our liquid starter uh, ahead of our wheat and our canola. And really all of us, every, anybody that, that works here on the farm with me, I've noticed it and even my dad, you know, kind of unsolicited. There's just something different to the color of our crops this fall. Once we started eliminating the industrialized fertilizer, we kind of noticed that anyway. I, each year, really, for the last three years, that we took those out of the system. Things came out of the ground faster. They just seemed healthier. Whether it's been somebody that's only worked here for a couple of years or somebody that's been around this farm for 20, we all go, it just looks better. There's just something to it. But this year, it, again, I'm, I'm very proud that my dad was able to just unsolicited come out and go, I don't know what you're doing, but there's just a color to your wheat that you know, he's 80 years old. He, he's seen a lot of wheat. How do you quantify that? You don't. But it, that color 
can go back to a presentation I've probably heard 15 different times from 15 different presenters that said if you take the industrializer, the synthetic or whatever else out of that root zone and let the biology do what it's given the knowledge to do by mother nature or whoever, basically get out of the way of the biology, you'll start to see these results. Well, I'm seeing it. I don't need, you know, I don't need a lot of research, replicated trials to tell me that I can see it matches the slide that I saw in Acres in 2019. <laughs> I would tell somebody just getting going uh, to sit on the internet for a little bit. If I get a call from somebody, I send them a picture of my reading list. And that's everything from Ray Archuleta to Gabe Brown to Elaine Ingham to, you know, go watch these people. And don't, don't let your mind go to, well, that won't work in my area. The soil health principles will work anywhere. Just, just listen for a while and then begin to see how it's going to fit your context. I hated chemistry in, in school, but biology, at least I could equate it to my own body uh, and kind of what was going on. So when I came back to farm, the soil health journey really, you know, it was fascinating. As I look back, how fast we ended up talking about biology. I went to a something somewhere where they were talking about different fertilizers and everything else. And they were talking about why you needed zinc or you needed magnesium or copper or whatever else. But they said, well, you know, you got to be careful because if you mix too much of this, well, here's this molder's chart. Here, this is how simple this is. Look at this. If you, if you try this, we well, just got to watch that it's going to antagonize these four things over here. And so you need a little bit of that, but of course that pisses these four elements off. And, and I thought, I'll never get this. There's no way. No way they, I mean, no wonder they can't, they continue to sell me crap because all they got to do is snow me with the molder's chart. You know, I, I got to sell you zinc because, of course, you know, you're not going to get your copper without your zinc or however all that works. But when you begin to talk about if you just get out of the way of the soil biology and it'll do it for me, I'm in. <laughs> get, get something, somebody's going to do something for me and I don't have to write a check for it. Again, to plagiarize a, a Gabe Brown, he, he would rather sign the back of the check than the front of the check. And that, <clears throat> you know, we mentioned or we talked about earlier, this is very marginal farm ground at best. You know, when my dad got here, I'm sure he was, I think he paid $15,000 for his first combine. If I was to get the combine I wanted today, it's a million dollars. And yet I'm not growing a whole lot more bushels of wheat uh, than he did. The average price of, of wheat actually, interestingly enough, today is barely 50% or 50 cents larger or higher than the 40 year average. Hopefully. The numbers don't pan, they don't pan out anymore. And so biology just seems, I guess, not to simplify it too much, just simpler than this whole chemical stuff that the industrial salesmen, I, I would tell you, there's no way they understand that. And I think that's what's gotten us in trouble. The more we put nitrogen, let's just go simply with more nitrogen, they have the list of things that it's messing up that then requires me, I've got a weed problem then, my, my biggest weed around here is a Russian thistle. What, what does a Russian thistle love? High nitrates. What do I do? I keep continuing to put nitrates in the soil and all I'm doing is, is helping the Russian thistle out, which of course makes the Roundup salesman happy because I gotta have more Roundup to control the Russian thistle. And so people that are around soil health know this vicious cycle. I just think there's a, a positive cycle out of this and it's, it's biology, it's not, it's not chemistry. On my broad acres, I just don't, there's just not enough cattle, there's not enough water infrastructure, and so what's the next way I can introduce that biology? And it's through the extractor and through the, the extracts, uh, whether that be compost, whether that be worm castings, whether that be whatever that, that medium is. I've got the equipment that we can introduce that. I can do it with, at the time of seeding, which we, you know, we all know, or I guess I believe, that the seed signals all of that biology to wake up and get going and, and begin that process of nutrient cycling. Uh, my agronomist has the bio extractor. In fact, we run two of them. And he has the, the worm castings that we're using for our extract. He shows up with his trailer, wheels the two machines out. Um, I have 7,000 gallons of water there waiting for him. He runs the extract out into totes. And you know, this is our first year. And so we learned that some of that grit, I guess, lack of a better term, 
can get through. And we learned in the end product, in our seed drill, that that was plugging our orifices. So just all learning things, not that it's an issue or anything else that we can't get through. And so the system I implemented was is to run it through a tote. I filter that. I filter out of my tanker truck. Uh, we're running three drills. And so I deliver 4,000, split 4,000 gallons a day through three drills. We try not to let any of that sit overnight in that once we've introduced the food, the humix and the sugars and everything to the, to the biology, things get very lively overnight. And then that's injected uh, either with the seed or near within an inch of the seed uh, in our seeding program. I love the way my agronomist explained it to me, the humic and the sugar, basically, he likens it to the lunchbox for the biology. It's, that's enough to keep them happy until that seed signals everybody to, to tell them to get going. And so your next question should be, do you think it's working? Well, <laughs> for me to get my dad to call me up and go, but I don't know what you're doing, but your color of your wheat looks pretty good. There must be something different there. Another weakness that we have is I tried too many things at once. And so, you know, it, it, is it the, I, who's to say it's not the molasses and the humic that I put down? It, it's obvious, the rhizosheath around my roots. I mean, in fact, I, the cows, we, we mentioned the, cow, the cows got out the other day. And normally when they, on something that's just a sprout out of the ground, they would have pulled it out of the ground. And I, I got down on my hands and knees they weren't able to pull it out. Well, that, that root is already huge. I mean, there's four times, or I'd tell you even more than that, below ground already for a single shoot of wheat. Well, that, that it's gotta be twofold. We've got the synthetic out of there and the biology working. You know, my ultimate would be that system where I grow a diverse mix and it's cows, and I don't, and this equipment goes away. That, that's ultimately where I want to be. It's just that that ship can't happen tomorrow. We've always got some sort of experiment going um, with good fortune of working with my alma mater, uh, WSU, Washington State University. Uh, we've got a sorghum and millet trial going. Um, we also have the longest running biosolid test plots in the nation. Just good fortune to have those here on the ranch. And uh, those, are, those are actually a good learning moment um, you know, obviously the focus of those biosolid plots were the biosolids. You know, what is it doing to the soil? What is the best application rate? And I focused more in on, in those trials that have been here since 1994, in that they had a control and they had a commercial fertilizer trial in that. And I've kind of focused in on those because that's where a majority of my cropland still is. Seattle, if you can picture this, doesn't have enough biosolids to, to apply to all my land every year. If, if you can imagine that, there's really not that much that comes out of there. And the first thing that they, they ran for me was comparing commercial fertilizer to the control. And since 1994, on those plots, I'm not going to say that that applied to anywhere else, maybe not even in that field, but on those plots, the commercial fertilizer never paid for itself. So the dollar input never ever returned the yield. The biology in the control versus the, the commercial, there's much more of a balanced bio, uh, bacteria to fungi ratio in the control. Again, has not had any synthetics or anything applied to it. it. All it does is substantiate and validates everything we've been told in all of this learning that I do, you know, whether it be through the internet or groups or going to all the conferences or whatever else. I, I had it slapping me in the face the whole time. The commercial wasn't working. And, and guess what I was writing a check for?